Few, if any, figures in rock and roll history are as timeless or controversial as Elvis Presley. Both a rebel and a heartthrob, Elvis changed the way the world thought about music, pop culture, and celebrity. Here's what the last 12 months of Elvis's life were like. As a young man embracing both a punishing work schedule and the stresses of newfound celebrity, Elvis was under a tremendous amount of pressure. Young Elvis became dependent on several different types of prescription drugs, specifically amphetamines to keep him awake and barbiturates to help him sleep or relax. Early on, these were heavily pushed by his manager, the infamous Colonel Tom Parker, who many believe swindled the naive young Elvis while running him ragged. By 1976, Elvis wasn't just getting his uppers and downers from his manager. He had a private doctor who would prescribe him any pill he asked for, according to a People magazine story published shortly after his death. Dr. George Nicopolis, aka Dr. Nick, traveled with Elvis and carried three suitcases of pills to make sure he could fulfill any of Elvis's needs. It was reported that over the last 20 months of Elvis's life, Dr. Nick prescribed him over 12,000 pills. The doctor claimed that they were for Presley's entourage as well. His excuse for throwing all these high-octane drugs around? If he didn't prescribe the pills to Elvis, someone else would, and at least this way he wouldn't get them off the street. The toxicology report from Elvis's death said he had the opiates Dilaudid, Demerol, and Percodin in his blood, not to mention quaaludes and codeine. However, though Dr. Nick was charged with 11 felony counts of overprescribing drugs, he was acquitted. The medical examiner claimed that Elvis had died of heart disease, adding, Had these drugs not been there, he still would have died. By 1976, Elvis had become disenfranchised and unhinged, his drug use, unhealthy lifestyle, and financial excess chipping away at his composure. He spent most of his time holed up in the elaborate den of his Memphis home, Graceland's Jungle Room, nicknamed for its exotic decor. Most worrisome to his record label, RCA, was that the king had become entirely uninterested in going into the studio and recording. That was when producer Felton Jarvis had a game-changing idea. If Elvis wouldn't go to the studio, they'd bring the studio to Elvis. Presley had recorded tracks at his home in Palm Springs in 1973 to great success and said that he enjoyed being in a room with his fellow musicians to feed off their emotions. So why not set up a mobile studio in Graceland? Elvis approved the idea, and the label sent a studio truck to his home. In many ways, the jungle room was perfect for the task. It was huge, and its shag carpeting naturally absorbed ambient sound, although the fake waterfall did have to be turned off. It was there in October 1976 that Elvis recorded his final studio sessions, resulting in some of his most memorable and emotionally crushing material to date. In November 1976, Elvis split with his girlfriend of four years, Linda Thompson. Linda had been a stabilizing force in the singer's world, but she eventually left him because she wanted a more normal life. Replacing Linda was actress Ginger Alden, a woman 20 years Elvis's junior. In December 1976, after a brief courtship, the singer gave her a $70,000 engagement ring, an expenditure that many thought was more for show than actual sentiment. In turn, many in Elvis's entourage believed Ginger to be nothing more than a gold digger. Lamar Fike, a member of Elvis's Memphis Mafia entourage, famously said Ginger, quote, didn't give a rat's ass about him. In Ginger's mind, these opinions were unfair aspersions cast by her fiancé's cronies. She explained her side of the story in a 2019 interview with Elvis's Australian fan club while promoting her book Elvis and Ginger, Elvis Presley's fiancé and last love finally tells her story. Not getting to know them well, shortly after Elvis passed away, I was extremely disappointed to see the character of some that Elvis had around him. A few speculated and began telling untruths regarding Elvis and me, which were completely unwarranted, mean-spirited, and wrong. When critics and fans describe Elvis in his later years, it's not always done in the nicest of terms, but it's undeniable that Elvis's overeating and weight issues colored his last year on Earth. According to the New York Daily News, by the end of his life, Elvis was consuming enough calories to feed several people every day. Growing up in the South, Elvis took comfort in greasy, homestyle foods. As an adult, one of his favorite meals was a roll stuffed with bacon, peanut butter, and jelly, alongside midnight snacks like hamburgers and deep-fried bread. While he was also taking many dangerous pharmaceuticals throughout his life, it was the heart disease caused by his bad diet that may have been the greatest factor in his demise. The critics noted his weight gain when reviewing his public performances. In Reese Quinn's biography Elvis, writer Tony Sherman is quoted as saying that, by early 77, Presley had become a grotesque caricature of his sleek, energetic former self. Hugely overweight, his mind dulled by the pharmacopoeia he daily ingested, he was barely able to pull himself through his abbreviated concerts. Most challenging during Elvis's final years was the non-stop schedule of his live performances. During many shows, the audience wouldn't be able to understand what he was saying, and he would often leave the stage early, unable to continue. This manifested most notably in March 1977 during two stops in Louisiana. According to a 1977 review in Alexandria Town Talk, the first show in Alexandria lasted less than an hour before Elvis had to leave the stage. But according to the book, the mystery surrounding the death of Elvis Presley, even worse was in Baton Rouge. 
where Elvis had to cancel the show because he couldn't make it out of his hotel bed in order to get to the venue. The rest of the tour was subsequently canceled, acting as a benchmark of just how far the king had fallen from the pedestal of his youth. I don't know all the chords, so if you hear me, you know, get my fingers caught in, in the keys back here, you know, you know what it is. By 1977, Elvis had lost all interest in recording new music. However, the home recording sessions of 1976 were fruitful and seemed to inspire a burst of creativity in the King. After the final recording session in October of 76, RCA set to work cobbling the tracks together in what would be Elvis's final records, a fact none of them knew but which the pained music seems to foreshadow in hindsight. Moody Blue, released in February 1977, was a mix of live recordings and new studio tracks, containing two of Presley's most widely regarded songs. The title track Moody Blue became Elvis's final number one single. The song is in keeping with the pop music of the time, but still showcases the warbly lone figure that the singer had become. But it's She Thinks I Still Care that is regarded by many to be Elvis's finest latter-day moment. Elvis's passing is often used as the archetypal rock star death, a tragic accident caused by poor health and drug use. But was the king simply ignoring his well-being, or was he having suicidal thoughts? In the recent HBO documentary Elvis Presley The Searcher, the singer's longtime wife Priscilla revealed that she wasn't sure whether Elvis's death was really an accident. Priscilla pointed out that Elvis had written a note to a friend and Memphis Mafia member Joe Esposito which stated, I'm sick and tired of my life. Additionally, a report from the tabloid The Sun shows that Priscilla considered depictions of Elvis as a bystander in his own life to be inaccurate, saying that he was simply dismissive of attempts to help him get treatment. She said, He knew what he was doing, and people go, Why didn't anyone do anything? Well, that's not true. People there in the inner group did, but you did not tell Elvis what to do. You'd have been out of there faster than a scratched cat. They would try, and no way. Elvis's last gig was on June 26, 1977 at the Market Square Arena in Indianapolis to a crowd of 18,000 fans. The set list included many of his classic hits like Hound Dog, Don't Be Cruel, and Jailhouse Rock, as well as newer numbers like Hurt and his cover of Bridge Over Troubled Water. As he had in recent gigs, Elvis appeared overweight and at times winded, but was reported to have given a solid performance overall. What confused some people, though, was that Elvis took a portion of the show to introduce everyone from his life and career from the stage. The moment came toward the end of the night, just before his closing performance of Can't Help Falling In Love With You. Many would later wonder if this was because Elvis knew somewhere deep down that he would never play again and wanted to shout out all of those who had made his career possible. Equally cryptic for some were the parting words the King said as he left the stage. To meet you again, may God bless you. Adios. Like many stars who became hugely famous before the concept of celebrity handlers had been formalized, Elvis was surrounded by yes-men and sycophants. This was especially true during the last year of his life, when he was deep in his chemical dependence and had left behind many of the loyal friends of his youth. The King's only true friend near the time of his death was arguably Letitia Henley, his live-in nurse. While the world at large saw Elvis as the man who had it all, Letitia, known to those around Elvis as Tish, had a private window into his personal struggles. Henley later wrote in her book, Taking Care of Elvis, Memories with Elvis as his private nurse and friend, He was not only my patient, but a good friend. He was miserable. He was depressed about aging and not having a woman he loved. He missed Priscilla. His friends kept pimping him with pretty 17- and 18-year-old girls, but he had nothing in common with them. Even Tish lives with pain surrounding Elvis's death, which she said came as a complete shock to her. When Elvis asked for sleeping pills during his final hours, it was she who told his private doctor where to find them, and she regrets not being there as he died. Given his pill dependency and excessive weight, some might assume that Elvis spent the day before his death lying in bed eating or doing drugs. But even more strange might be the sheer amount of activity undertaken by the King in the hours before he passed away. As detailed in the documentary Elvis Presley, The Last 24 Hours, Elvis's final day on Earth included a nighttime trip to the dentist in search of prescription drugs, a 4 a.m. game of racquetball with his cousin Billy Smith, and an impromptu piano performance of classics, including Blue Eyes Crying in the Rain. The night ended around 6 the next morning, when he went into the bathroom to read. He was found there by Ginger Alden around 2 p.m. on August 17th. Memphis Mafia foreman Joe Esposito said, The phone rings, intercom. One of the maids picks up the phone and it's Ginger. She says, come upstairs, I need help. Elvis just fainted. I ran upstairs, I go into the bathroom, and Elvis had fell over and was lying on the floor. I turned him over, and I knew. I knew he was dead. Elvis Aaron Presley died August 16, 1977, at the age of 42. For fans of rock and roll everywhere, the King's death was a monumental blow. But with his life ended, those who loved him could now remember the man he had once been, revolutionizing rock music with his energy, charisma, and raw talent. 
If you or someone you know is struggling with addiction, please call the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Administration's 24-7 National Helpline at 1-800-662-HELP. That's 1-800-662-4357.